You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. A few months ago, a friend sent me a link. It was from a newsletter called The Hyphen, run by UK podcaster, author and columnist Emma Gannon. Emma was letting her subscribers know that she was cancelling her internationally successful podcast after six years and more than 12 million downloads. She wasn't starting a new podcast. She wasn't starting a new job. She wasn't going on maternity leave. She wasn't unwell. And the podcast wasn't losing listeners. It was actually growing every week and it was earning her fantastic money. Emma was axing it just because she was done. She wrote at the time, I've changed. My goals have changed. My lifestyle has changed. My career priorities have changed. And I've always said, when I stop enjoying making it, I will stop. It was such a difficult realisation to come to. And the hard bit isn't always closing something down when it's no longer working. It's closing something down when it still does. And at the time that I read it, I was actually having the same conversation in my head about this podcast. I just didn't know how to tell anyone that I wanted to quit No Filter. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman, and you're still listening to No Filter. Spoiler, I didn't quit. There are lots of different flavours of burnout. Physical burnout is the kind that you probably think of when you hear the word, where you're physically exhausted from working too long, too hard, for too many hours a day, over too many weeks, or years or even decades. But there's also other types of burnout, like creative burnout, which comes from doing the same thing so many times you become numb and then repelled by it. Emma Gannon is a wildly successful journalist, podcaster and author. And her most recent book, The Success Myth, Letting Go of Having It All, is not a whinge about how hard it is to be successful. It's actually the opposite. It's all about why the things that we measure success on, like being rich, famous, even having kids. She wants to talk about why those are in fact myths. And Emma knows this very well because when she found herself giving a talk on a fancy island for which she was paid huge money, she was staying at a fancy hotel, she sat on her bed back in 2018 in that fancy hotel room and she realised that she'd completely lost touch with herself. Her success had impacted every inch of her life, both positively and negatively. She ticked so many of those external markers for success. She was wealthy. She was famous. She was doing something that seemed outwardly to be kicking all the goals. But her actual life wasn't quite so rosy. She'd lost touch with friends. She was too busy to take care of herself. And she felt empty and miserable, which is when she realized that no amount of success is worth your health. And what happened afterwards took everyone, especially Emma, by surprise. Here's Emma again. Em, your newsletter at the start of the year about quitting your podcast, I was trying to quit mine at the same time. You seem to have pulled it off and yet here I still am. Do you know what's funny though is for this new book, I've actually recorded a mini series podcast, which is now going live. So I think I just needed a rebrand. I haven't completely stepped away, but Control-Alt-Delete has died. That is true. No more. I was so struck by the sparseness of your final episode. It was a four-minute voice note from you. Control-Alt-Delete was one of the OG, you know, before podcasting was even a thing. It's like the pre-serial days when, you know, we had to explain to people what podcasts were. So you were one of the early, early pioneers, not like now where having a podcast is bog standard and everyone has one. Can you tell me a little bit about what led to that decision to stop it? Yes. So I knew that I'd been doing it for six years. I'd changed so much. My interests had changed a bit. Podcasting, the industry had changed a lot. And it was this nagging voice, but the podcast was really successful. It was making a lot of money. It was my kind of validation, I guess, of, you know, I had all these millions of downloads. And I've got to admit, I did enjoy being at the helm of something that was working. You know, I've worked in the media for so long and things don't always work. Mm. So I knew I didn't want to do it anymore, but I was also too scared to pull the plug because it was my main income stream and it was my main job. So it took maybe two years to really 
get that courage. I think anyone listening who has left a big job will know it's not easy. But in October 2022, I went through a really bad burnout. So I essentially started having panic attacks. I couldn't really get out of bed. The world was sort of shifting beneath my feet and it was really scary. And I just kind of went to the park and got a coffee and sat with myself and I journaled and it was like, you need to stop the podcast. So it was very abrupt. I was quite unwell. Mm. And so that's why that last episode is so sparse, because I'm so burnt out walking through the forest, Mm. recording it. (laughs) It was very unapologetic. You didn't say, but this is why I'm doing it. You weren't being deliberately clickbaity, but it seemed like you were very resolute. And I wanted to ask you about your burnout. But before I did, you're in your early 30s now. Tell me about your 20s. My 20s were really fun and I kind of pine after them a little bit, which is weird because obviously I'm much happier now. But I was quite a outspoken, like kind of rebellious, like didn't want anyone telling me what to do, kind of 20 something. So even though I got, you know, kind of classic jobs, nine to five jobs, I worked in PR and I worked at Condé Nast and all that stuff. I had a blog on the side and I just knew that work was broken and I just wanted to do it my own way. And I was probably that annoying millennial in the office, which is now Gen Z. (laughs) But I pushed back on quite a lot. I did a lot of traveling. And really, my 20s was what made my career. And a few years ago, I actually moved out of my old flat that I lived in for like the whole of my 20s. And I was just sobbing when we moved house because that flat in my 20s, like that built my career. And it was like I was saying goodbye to all of that and moving on. So Yeah, I'm proud of what I built in my 20s. It's so funny researching you for this podcast. I went to your website because I'm a journalist and there's a picture of you holding the success myth on the front page of your website. And then it says about me and it is the longest list of accomplishments. It goes on for paragraphs and paragraphs about all the things you've done. And you've done some incredible things. One of the highlights of which in terms of objective measures of success would be being named in the Forbes 30 under 30 list of most successful people in the media industry. Can you tell me about the moment you found out you were going to be on that list? Yes, it was A few weeks before, I think I was followed on Twitter or something by the Forbes list. And I was like, that's weird. And so it planted the seed. But then I was like, no, probably not. That's crazy. Like, why would I be on there? And then, yeah, I remember the night before kind of checking it because I knew it was going to go live the next day. And then I saw my name. So it was a huge moment. It really was a huge moment for me because I think I did want that validation at the time. Mm. And I think so many of us do. And then when you get it, that's why I wrote this book, because I feel like I've sort of got to this point earlier than I thought I would. And now I'm reflecting on like, well, what next? And it's an interesting feeling. You write in the book about the myth of arrival, that idea that when this happens, I'll feel successful. I mean, that's a fairly big place to arrive, being named by Forbes as one of the 30 most successful people in their 20s in your entire industry. Did you feel like you'd arrived in that moment? Did you feel successful? I guess I felt successful on society's terms. Yes. Like I post it on Instagram and everyone goes mad and it's like, wow, you're amazing. But what's interesting is I didn't feel great when that happened. Like there's been many times in my life where I felt way better. The smaller moments or connecting with readers or hosting an event or, you know, things that were on my terms. I think what's really interesting is when we're given these stamps of approval it's like we're meant to want them, but actually the actual thing itself is quite empty. I talk about in the book going to the party, the Forbes party, and feeling really weird. Like I was surrounded by random people. It was quite elite. It was quite exclusive. It felt like a club that I didn't really want to be part of. That's not why I got into writing, just to get sort of a badge of honour. And I didn't get a good vibe from the night. And I'm someone that really thinks that we need to go back to our values and we need to go back to our body language and go back to, you know, vibe sounds very woo woo, but like, how do you feel in that moment? And I did not feel good. And so I think what I'm trying to do in this book is split out what looks good and what feels good. And what feels good isn't actually a lot of those things. 
I want to go to 2018, which is just a little bit after you were named on that list. You were on a plane, you were on a light plane, and it was very turbulent. What was going on in your life at that time? So the multi-hyphen method book came out that year. and Can you explain what that book was about? Yes. So that book was about being a multi-hyphenate. So I was someone that had lots of different income streams and strands going on. And I was surrounded by so many people that were like, what do you do? And when I said a few different things, they got confused and they almost felt sorry for me. And I was like, no, 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 this is a great thing. I want to rebrand this as a positive. You know, jack of all trades has always been stereotyped, but I love being a multi-hyphenate. So that was what that book was about. And it was really successful. It did really well. I got an endorsement from Richard Branson and all these people. And then what comes along with that is going on tour and doing speaking gigs. And I'm an introvert. I actually feel like I put a lot of pressure on my nervous system during that time that was actually really uncomfortable. I was completely out of my comfort zone for like a whole year. And I think what I want to talk about is not, oh, poor me, I got all these amazing speaking gigs. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, Sometimes we get really carried away with other people getting excited or other people thinking we should have a promotion or other people thinking we should get married or have kids or whatever it is. Mine was like, you should now do all these things and pretend to be more confident and do all these things and travel around the world when really I wanted to stay at home writing. And so I guess what I'm saying is that was amazing, but for someone else. Yeah, because who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want to be flying around being paid? You were paid to go to some beautiful tropical island and speak at a conference, stay at a fancy hotel, and yet you ended the night alone in a hotel room. Were you in tears on your bed? Yeah, it was a really vivid memory and moment where I was surrounded by lots of nice things. Mm but I felt totally empty and miserable and I'd completely lost touch with my life. You know, we talk about this all the time, like money doesn't buy happiness. And of course, you know, those things matter. It's lovely to have nice things. But in that moment, I really realized that I was in this lovely hotel room being flown to do this talk, but I'd lost touch with my friends. I'd forgotten someone's birthday. One of my friends had just had a kid and I'd really forgotten all about it. I was too busy to take care of myself, like take care of my body. I felt so empty and really miserable. And it was just such a classic moment. And I was like, I've got this all wrong. I need to really go back to what my definition of success is because it's not this. In the movie version of this, you would get up, go to the airport, come home and change your life. Is that what happened? No, I did nothing (laughs) for a few (laughs) years, even though I had the realisation. This is the thing about this book as well, is like changing your life is really hard and really scary. So even though you know what you've got to do, it's like doing it is another thing. And, you know, I I should make clear that the book's not about – oh, it's so hard for successful people and when you get there, you won't even like it. It's more the pressure that we put on ourselves to get to a certain place, but that basically it's a mirage because it's not just about financial success or career success. It's also about success in other aspects of our life, right? It's about what society tells us we should be doing. Yes. And also that success isn't just the goal. And I think Every time I got the goal, I was like, well, how come the clouds haven't parted and there's a marching band and I feel amazing? It's because that's not the moment you feel successful. Successful is a lifetime of having good days or good moments. And, you know, it's cliche, but it is kind of the journey and what you're making along the way. So, yeah, I had to reframe that. And thank you for saying that because it's quite hard talking about this book because I don't want people thinking that I'm just like complaining. It's not really about me. But there is a chapter on celebrity and happiness and money. And I'm happy to unpick those myths because they're so ingrained in our culture. Like we so buy into that until we have these conversations, really. Well, let's do that because when you ask most kids, most teenagers, most primary school students what they want to be when they grow up, they'll say, I want to be an influencer. I want to be famous. Is it all it's cracked up to be? Well, it really depends because you know, it's such a broad term influencer, like you could be an influencer who raises money for your local school or 
you know, write something that you feel really passionate about and share it with the world. I mean, I think that word has been sort of categorized in a negative way, perhaps. I think the internet is such an amazing tool and we can do whatever we want. As you've obviously proven as well, like through the years, you've been able to reach people from your bedroom back in the day. Mm. And so I think it's just really taking this idea of things being successful or kind of looking good to the outside world or this external validation. I think it's more about really sitting with ourselves because modern life is so stressful right now and we are bombarded with so many messages and like you say, you know, young people have more than ever got so many pressures to look good, to be seen as being successful. And I just want to break that sort of with a hammer and be like, what are we doing? Like, how are we going to rebuild this world so that we are actually happier in our day-to-day lives? You've written about performing success. What are some of the ways in which you perform success and why do we people, whether you're performing the success as a mother or as a hot woman or as a whatever you happen to be doing in your job, what does performing success look like and what does it actually mean? Why do we do it? Well, I think we do it because the culture really rewards it. Every time I post a picture where I look like I'm being successful, people are drawn to it because we're kind of like magpies. We're like, oh, I want a bit of that. We're programmed that way. So I, I don't ever blame anyone for doing it. And I was quite good at it, which is kind of a weird thing to admit, but what would I used you to do? work in marketing. Yeah. What would you do? You know, say you'd had actually quite a terrible day, but like one tiny thing had gone well and you would really make such a big deal out of the tiny thing that went well. You wouldn't paint the proper picture of that day, I suppose. Mm. And we all do it. We all do it all the time. And I think Then that went the other way where people were being really authentic by kind of like crying into their cameras all the time, which also was strange. And that also got a lot of attention. It's like the two ends of the spectrum got a lot of attention. But most of us live in the very boring middle most of the time. Yes, exactly. And I think it was just this move into the personal brand and how you could brand yourself and you could make yourself the product, make yourself look really shiny. And I write in the book really about how dehumanizing that is. And how, you know, I had to do so much work in like getting my old self back because I turned myself into a walking product, essentially, that looked really successful. But I'd sort of lost all of those things that make me me. And I think it's really important not to lose that for your mental health, really. Can you be specific about what you had to do and what you had to kind of subvert and have had to get back? I think it was just... Silly things like I grew up watching The Devil Wears Prada, watching Mad Men, watching Sex and the City. I really bought into that sort of Gen X, like boss woman culture. So Mm. I would like put on the suit and take the photos and want that moment of like being in the glass office. And I call it success theatre. Like I'm literally like pretending to be that successful thing. And really, that's like so far away from who I am. The whole thing was me being very confused about what success is. And our definitions change so much. So in my 20s, I write about in the book how I got very confused with like close friends and then like random acquaintances. Mm. You know, when you fall into that trap of like, your life is just like networking. Mm. (laughs) And so I wanted to get that back. Quite frankly, I think it's going to change again. Like, who knows what success will mean in my 40s? It might be wildly different again. So yeah, at the moment, it means just like taking care of myself, really. Up next, burnout. And asking how Emma realised that she had it. Asking for a friend. You also experienced burnout. Was that related to trying to be something that you weren't and living a life that was not true to what you were feeling? Yes, definitely. And it's really something I'm passionate about talking about because burnout, I think, has a bit of a myth around it, which is like you only burn out if you're like working, you know, crazy hours and you're a lawyer with like five children and you're traveling the world. Like you can only get burnout when you're pushed to your limits in Mm. that really crazy way. Mm. Whereas I'm a writer, like I'm not saying I, I don't work that much. Like this burnout was actually really strange because I think I'm someone that does have a handle on my life, actually. Like I work four days a week. It really shocked me. And talking to therapists about this, 
something that made me feel a bit better actually is that we've all got a different window of tolerance it's called so my tolerance levels are different to someone else and my tolerance levels basically couldn't cope with the amount on my shoulders and I don't want to feel shame about that because yeah. I'm sure some people would be like, why did you burn out so badly? But really what happened was I was so out of alignment with my goals, with who I am, with what I want from my life. And I think if you're a creative person, especially, or a writer, you're probably quite sensitive. <laughs> and I do think I'm quite sensitive. And so therefore it's important actually to be on your right path. Mm. The life coach, Martha Beck, helped me with this a lot. I actually trained with her to be a coach after my burnout and during it actually. So I got to make sense of it, but burnout can be a great thing. It's awful at the time. And I thought I was never going to get well, but it's essentially a breakthrough into the next period of your life, really. Burnout's become one of those words that people sort of roll their eyes about a little bit, or that's perhaps overused. How did your burnout start and then develop? Asking for a friend? Well, it's funny because I don't like the word burnout either, but I quite like the fact that, I don't know if this sounds a bit weird, but you know when a star burns out, there's something about how it's a very natural cycle burning out. It's like you burnt out of all that energy you had to give (gasps) and then you have to replenish. And it's like we go through these cycles in life. How did it feel? Well, it was quite existential. It was quite out of body. It was like Sounds like, again, out of a film, like that wake up call of like a voice coming down and being like, what are you doing with your life? But that's really how it felt. And it felt also like I was going underground. I'm someone that has been above ground for so long, making, creating, being out there, being accessible. And actually, I think I needed to do that caterpillar moment of like, go into the cocoon, figure out what you're doing, shut down the podcast, shut down everything. And for the first time in maybe 10 years, be with yourself. And I think that's something that is really terrifying and not something that we do in this culture at all. We have so much distraction. Why would I be with myself and go for long walks and journal when I could watch TV or... That sounds horrific. It's honestly... (laughs) Like I felt not being with you. I think me being with myself sounds horrific. I mean, it was cliche in many ways. Like I listened to like eat, pray, love on audiobook in bed, (laughs) but it was actually really lovely. And I feel much more connected to myself more than ever before. So it's horrible, but it was great too. Well, I want to ask about money because the idea of going underground, stopping the podcast, all I could think of when I heard that is like, but what about the show? But what about the money? But what? how do you just walk away from that? How? You know, it's funny. It reminded me of when I first quit my job at a magazine to go freelance. It was the exact same thing. I had to make a spreadsheet and be like, how am I going to pay my mortgage? And how am I going to live in a way where I could just get by and have no stresses? And actually, when I stripped it all back, I am very privileged. I admit that I was in a situation where I had multiple like passive income streams and stuff like that. But actually, when I boiled it down, I didn't need that much. Mortgage prices in the UK are crazy at the moment. It was not a great time. Mm. But I was earning more than I needed, way more. And it was really this moment of what are you going to sacrifice actually for your happiness? What are you going to sacrifice to have some freedom back? And I, yeah, I sacrificed quite a lot of money, but I don't regret it. And things are smaller now and I have to Mm. make different decisions now. And I'm not doing as many fancy things as I was before, but day to day, my life is so much better. Who did you have to discuss that with? Because you're married. Yeah, but we're not really, we're like very independent, which is something that I always wanted. Like when we first met, he would go away for five weeks at a time and I'd be like, bye. So yeah, of course I discussed it with him, but it was more of a I'm doing this than a we need to discuss this. But didn't your income impact on both of you and your sort of quality of life and standard of living and how you were going to pay the mortgage? Not really, no. We're sort of just like split down the middle. And as long as I kind of could cover my side of things, things were fine, really. Can you explain to people who don't understand what passive income might be, how that works? Yeah, I'm really passionate about this, especially for, you know, young entrepreneurs, because passive income really is 
such an amazing way of making money because you can then kind of free up your time to make other things. So for example, with my podcast, I'm not publishing any episodes. I'm publishing some replays, but I still make money off the podcast, even though I've not worked on it for seven months. Can you explain to people who don't understand how that would work? How can you make money when you're not doing something anymore? I have advertisers still on that podcast that are on old episodes. So that's how that works with revenue. And then I also licensed my audio to a company called Blinkist. They make my episodes into mini shortcasts over there. And I get a revenue stream from that every month. I also do Skillshare classes and they were recorded many years ago and I still make money from anyone who takes those courses. And my books, you know, obviously Mm. I get income from my books ongoing Substack, that's really great because even if I take a pause, you know, people are still signing up. So there are many different ways to make money in this world. And I'm really passionate about talking about money because we don't get told this stuff. It's not easy. You know, I've spent so long doing this and building this business, but money doesn't always have to mean actual kind of manual labor. It can Mm. be putting your work out there in a different way. If you work in the knowledge economy, I mean, if you're a nurse or a doctor, it can be more tricky, yes, right? Exactly. This is very niche, by the way, what I'm talking about. It's about literally like being a digital creator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you actually experienced the burnout, did you like wake up one morning and you were just couldn't get out of bed? What did it feel like and how fast did it come on? I would say that I had quite a few warning signs leading up to it. So, I think burnout doesn't come on that suddenly. At least it didn't for me. It was like little nudges that this was about to happen. But when it happened, that was when it took me down. I remember the day really clearly because I was with one of my best friends, which I'm so glad I was with her because it was really scary. And we were out together and then she drove me home and she was like, God, I'm really worried about you because I just felt so weak. So did you think you were getting sick or like COVID or something? Well, I think if anyone has had a panic attack, it manifested more in that way. Yeah. So it was my body, I think, panicking, actually, that things were kind of hanging by a thread. And what was amazing, actually, that I learned as well during that time is that even though I was just like in bed, not really being able to make sense of anything, my body had started to heal and my body was doing amazing things. Like it was getting all the adrenaline out of my system because I would be like vibrating with stress and it would just be like releasing everything and I would get up and do yoga and I didn't even remember it. It was like my body was like making me do it. I like left my phone at home and went on these really long walks and my body just like knew where to go. It was kind of wild, but it made me really respect my body in a a new way actually. How long did it take to I was going to say to pass, but it's like, it seems like it's something you went through that you had to like actively go through. Oh my God. It took so long. And I think anyone that works in this industry, you know, we like things to be done. We like to be productive. And I was like, (laughs) when am I going to get better? And a friend of mine who'd been through it, she was like, you need to give yourself six months. And I did work. I didn't take six months completely off, but it was like six months was really how long it took for me to kind of feel normal again, which is a really long time. And that's why I really like talking about it because if you can stop yourself in your tracks getting burnt out, you're going to save yourself a lot of hassle down the line. How much as you started to feel better, did that sort of muscle memory of striving for success kick back in? Yeah, it's funny. My friend was like, you wait, you'll get that sort of like ego thing of like, do people remember me? Like, what am I doing? Have I got anything to share? And I remember that coming in and being like, it's not worth it now. I think Mm -hmm. what I've realized is no amount of like outward success is worth my health. And it's a shame it had to take that for me to realize that. But now if I get invited to something that I don't want to do, because, you know, again, I'm lucky that I can choose, I don't do it because I know what the ramifications are if I do too many things that don't feel great. So again, you know, I know people listening might be like, well, you have to do things sometimes you don't want to do. That is true. But if you can say no, when you feel like you need to, this is a muscle we need to practice in having some agency over what we say yes and no to as well. How did you detox from or wean yourself off hustle culture? You know, because you've written about that extensively, hustle culture. 
Yeah, I mean, weirdly, like the multi-hyphen method got conflated with hustle culture because they were like, well, you have to hustle to have like multiple income streams, surely. Yeah. But actually that book isn't really saying that. It's saying that you can use your time in different ways. I see hustle culture as like having one really stressful big job. Multi-hyphen life can be actually... I don't know, quite enjoyable and like you can work in a flow and you can be creative and you have your own diary, you can take time off. Like it's all within your control, but that takes practice, which is why you can get sucked into never knowing when to stop. But I actually think that's the case for everyone. Like we're in a time now where you can continue making, like no one's telling you to put down the laptop. I could write like 10 blog posts today if I wanted to, Mm. but I'm going to choose to do one. It's almost like we need to limit ourselves. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know where that comes from, but it's real. How are you limiting yourself to one? Like, have you just turned off that voice that's like, do more, do more, do more? Yeah. And I have genuinely, I think, got to a place, and this might change, where I have a real grasp on what is enough for me. It's very personal. Like what I'm talking about might not be the case for someone else. But for me, I know what enough is. I know how much money I want to earn. Mm. I know how much free time I want to have. And I know that I don't want to work myself to the bone anymore. So what do I do to make that happen? I make different decisions and I take different things on. When you enjoy your work, I mean, listen, let's get the world's smallest violin out for you and I who love our jobs. Yeah. When it's actually enjoyable... How do you then not keep doing it and doing it and doing it? Because your podcast, for example, you spoke when you ended about looking back on it and you said, you know, I'd pinch myself because I would get to speak to these amazing people and sit down and talk about creativity and, you know, everyone from Elizabeth Gilbert to Greta Gerwig and Ava DuVernay and everyone, really, Seth Godin, everybody, like a dream list of hundreds of incredible people. How do you go, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have those conversations anymore. What changed? I think I really do do this work because I enjoy it. And I made peace a long time ago with like maybe never making much money doing this because who makes loads of money being a writer or podcaster? Like I'm not someone that's like thought that that would ever happen. So honestly, like anything is a cherry on top for me. If I get paid enough to write for a living, I've won. Like, I'm so happy with that. That was my dream as a child and it's my dream now. And so I didn't need to carry on doing the podcast, I guess. I could have kept growing it. I could have kept making more. I think what I'm saying in this book is like, when you have really cracked, like what is genuinely enough, it doesn't really matter how many more things you make. I also feel like I learned everything I needed to learn from that podcast. Like, Mm. Also, I didn't start that podcast to make it my job. The podcasting industry wasn't even a thing when I started that podcast. So I started it from this place of passion and learning and also trying to be generous with like my time and what I'd learned. And so I think I would have been inauthentic, actually, if I'd carried on doing it and Just not for the loved money. it and not yeah. enjoyed it. You know, I always think if anything went really bad, like I could always go and get another job and I'd be happy to do that. Mm. So I think in a way, like that medium for me was so sacred and so special that if my heart wasn't in it anymore, I could no longer do it. And I think that's why the multi-hyphen method is like something that is kind of weird to people sometimes because they're like, God, you're really treating your work as if it's like the love of your life or like a hobby. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, that's how I literally live my life. Tell me about the way that we've weaponized the idea of having a purpose and a passion into a stick to beat ourselves up with. Well, that's the other thing, I guess, is that it's not enough anymore to have a passion. You have to also be making loads of money from your passion. And also making the world better. Yes. And it's just so stressful. And I don't really like the word passion at all. I think it's really strange and it can burn out. It feels like something that like burns bright and then just Mm. fizzles. Whereas I think curiosity and interest is more up my street. I'm, you know, I got bored of the podcast and now I'm obsessed with Substack. Like that's my, I wouldn't say it's my passion. I'd say like, I'm super curious about this new platform. So if you can follow those breadcrumbs, that's so much better than having a purpose. And also, you know, on an existential level, I don't believe that human beings need to save the world or have a 
passion in that I do think inherently we're enough. I think like all of the amazing things that had to happen for you to be alive, for your grandparents to have met, for your ancestors to have met, for your parents to have met, for you to have like literally survived this long to be on this planet. Like why do we feel so worthless a lot of the time? I think that's what it comes from. I think people are productive because they feel like they're not worth anything. And really I think we need to get back in touch with the fact that like we're doing our best. We're actually good people. We're going to be okay. And really connecting with like that deeper level of ourselves. What you just said about, I think I'm enough, that's pretty radical thought, isn't it? Because especially as women, we live in a society that is telling us a hundred times a day in a hundred different ways that we're not enough. We're not pretty enough. We're not skinny enough. We're not young enough. We're not white enough. We're not flawless enough. We're not good enough mothers. We're not we're not enough. How do you get to that place? And is there a map I can follow? <laughs> it's so personal though, isn't it? Because like doing this work on yourself and realizing you're enough, it can take years of therapy. It can take a lot of long walks and soul searching. Like our lives are so busy that no one really has time to be doing this stuff. Like it's a massive luxury that I can go on my long walks and find myself. But also, I think we need to realize the trap that we're in. Like, society makes us pile things on. We get the house, we get the garden, mm. we get the dog, we have the kids, the kids have to go to a good school, then blah, 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 blah. Like, we're in competition with our friends or whatever, like, we're comparing all the time. And I think what I'm saying in this book is, like, what do you actually want from your life? Do you want all of those things? Like, is there anything you can take off? Is there anything you can say no to? Is there like a family holiday that you don't want to go on? Do you want to have kids? Like all of these questions, I think we're sold this definition of success that is so stressful. And I think a lot of us are very tired. And so I'm happy really to be like, not the punching bag, <laughs> but like, I'm happy to like put myself on the line in this book and be like, look, let's talk about it. And I can use my own story as a little bit of a jumping off point. But actually, this is about each and every one of us going on a personal journey with it. And just finally, I mean, I could talk to you for 100 years, obviously, but the success myth that as a woman, you have to become a mother. That's another one that you've really pushed against. Is that a recent decision that you've made to push against it? Or have you always secretly known, but now you're just saying it out loud? I think in my 20s, I thought I would have them, like me and my husband would talk about it, but it felt so far away. So it's like, it felt easy to say and felt easy to daydream about because one day, one day kind of thing. And then as I creeped up closer to 30, it just became so apparent that that is just not for me. And, you know, who knows, there could be a plot twist later down in life, but it really doesn't appeal to me at all. And People find that very weird to hear. I was at a baby shower not that long ago when I said that and she just couldn't accept it. It was like, no, 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 you, you will change your mind. And I think that's what I find interesting. Like as a curious person, I'm like, oh, how interesting that like it makes people uncomfortable because I'm pretty certain that it's not for me. And I get really excited about all the things I'm going to do in the future, but none of those things involve having kids. You've said that people are like, but how do you know? And you're like, well, when you think of how excited you feel about the idea of having kids, as you say, I feel excited about all the things I'm going to do without kids, which I think is such an interesting, positive, optimistic way of framing it and kind of a radical way of framing it really, because I've heard you say before that people with children are very invested in you wanting to have children and are like quite condescending in that you'll change your mind, you'll change your mind. Why do you think that is? I have no idea because it, it really doesn't impact them. Because I'm fighting that in myself to say, oh, no, but, you know, you just, you should. But, like, why should you? I don't know. Maybe because I really love it. But then I love lots of things that you might not necessarily love. Why would I force that on you? Or is it just something that we've internalized? I mean, that's what women are, you know, taught that we're here on earth for, right? It takes a yeah. long time to get over that. I mean, maybe it is like someone coming back from a really great holiday and being like, you have to go. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like maybe it is that. And maybe it's like, oh, okay, maybe. And one of my best friends has just had a baby and she's like, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'm completely in love. Like 
you know, she really is going through like the best moment of her whole entire life. But I'm like, I can really separate that out as like her amazing moment. Mm. And I think it's really important to do that. Like we are separate entities and what's right for you is not right for me. And, you know, something I learned in coaching is like really tap into what lights you up. And when I talk about the future without kids, like my eyes light up. So it's like, I have to believe that as being the truth. Yeah, that's really true. The idea of Amy Poehler said her philosophy is good for her, not good for me. Yes. And also I am getting invited along to all my friends, like baby's things. And like, I'm being included because I wrote my novel, Olive, Mm. about the main character feeling like she was being excluded and like, I'm not being excluded. So that's lovely. You're just not curious about it. That's the thing. Like your curiosity hasn't led you there because I think also, you know, when I had children, it wasn't that I was burning to be a mother, but I think I was just kind of curious about what it would be like. And I think your curiosity isn't leading you there. So why would you want to override that? That's very, very true, actually, about curiosity. It leads you and you don't know where it's going to lead you, but you follow it and end up somewhere good. And McGowan, tell me about your life now. You just launched this book called The Success Myth after dismantling many of the pillars of or the outward pillars of success in your own life. Post burnout, post finishing the book and promoting it at a slightly more sedate level than perhaps you've promoted your other books. What does life look like for you now? Life is really good now. I feel, you know, like I've mended myself over however many months. I feel really close to my friends. My sister's getting married in a few days. I feel like I'm loving my home more than ever because I'm actually spending time in it. (laughs) The sun's coming out in London and my work-life balance is good. I just reprioritized a lot and I'm loving Substack. That's like my new kind of mini business, which as you said, it kind of reminds you of the heyday of blogging. And I feel like I'm really going back to the things I love again. So hopefully this lasts and I don't have to reframe success every 10 years, but I probably will. So I'm going to enjoy it while it lasts. But thanks for having me because like you say, I've been promoting this book in a different way and I feel like I've been having really great conversations with people I've really wanted to talk to. So thank you. So as you may have gathered by the fact that I'm talking to you now, I didn't quit No Filter, mostly because I kind of couldn't. I wasn't allowed. It's hard being the co-founder of the company. Of course, I was allowed to quit. But what I actually did was I stepped back a little bit. Claire Murphy came and did a few interviews. I regathered myself, I guess, and I fell back in love with this podcast. So I've still got some more petrol in the tank. You can find Emma's many books via the link in our bio. I just loved this book so much. She also writes a very popular weekly newsletter, the one I mentioned at the start of this episode. It's called The Hyphen, and it's an exploration of ideas that have got her thinking in new ways. We'll link to that in the show notes. Emma has written lots of books, including the novel that she mentioned, Olive, which is about a woman who decides not to have children. This episode was produced by Cassie Merritt. Our executive producer is Eliza Ratliff with sound production by Madeline Juanu. And if you've enjoyed this episode and you want me to keep doing it and you want unlimited access to the subscriber-only episodes that we make of No Filter, please become a Mamma Mia subscriber. I would love it if you supported my work and the work of No Filter and Mamma Mia by clicking on the link in the show notes. I'm Mia Friedman. Thank you for having me in your ears and I promise I'll be back next week. 